The year is 1855, Washington County, Wisconsin, recently separated from Ozaki County, had picked West Bend as a location of its county seat. Homes and businesses began to dot the landscape, including the courthouse and the jailhouse. Those two buildings would be put to the test in August of that year after a horrific murder and subsequent capture stirred up residents and outsiders alike. And the events of one day in particular would later be documented in the book Dark Lanterns by Jack H. Anderson. In this episode, I will take you to the locations depicted in the book and tell you about what happened leading up to, during, and after the lynching of George Tabar. So join me on this road trip into the dark history of West Bend, Wisconsin. Jack H. Anderson's book goes into pretty good detail about the many things that were happening back in 1855. What I'm going to do is stick to the murder, the lynching, and the trial. I highly suggest that you purchase Dark Lanterns to learn the intricate details behind some of the issues surrounding the events that took place in August of 1855 in West Bend, Wisconsin. This is Washington Street or Highway 33. Back in 1855, this was Newburgh Road. Now behind me here is the West Bend Woolen Mill. It is in this area where back in 1855, Christian Young's Mill once stood. Now George DeBar resided at that location at the time of the murder. We are on Clearview Drive, just north of Washington Street, which was Newburgh Road back in 1855. It was in this general area where a crime was committed. Now, that may not seem like much of a big deal. However, this particular event at the time was considered so horrific that one Milwaukee newspaper called it one of the most diabolical in the history of the young state up to that point and would trigger an event that's unfortunately forever etched in the history of West Bend, Wisconsin. It was August 1st around 11 p.m. when John Muir and his wife Mary, who were in bed, were awoken by the sound of someone knocking at their door. John asked who it was, and the response was George DeBar. Muir then asked, what do you want? I've come to get what you owe me, replied DeBar. John asked Mary to join him, fearing George will be mean. They got dressed and went and opened the door, and there was George, looking sweaty and fatigued. After George was paid, he asked for some water. John offered some beer, then proceeded to go down to the cellar to retrieve some. As he started to come back up, he was struck in the head by DeBar, knocking him back down. As George looked down to see where he was, Muir grabbed him by the hair. At this point, Mary had run from the house towards her father-in-law, who lived about 220 yards away. To the north. The bar was able to free himself and went after Mary, catching up to her about 55 yards from the elder Muir's residence. Words were exchanged and as they were going back, a hired boy, Paul Winderling, age 14, had awoken and was out with Muir on the road shouting, MURDER! At this point, the bar proceeds to cut Mary's throat and stabs her in the left breast and right hip. George then set his sights on Muir and Winderling. They both ran toward a cornfield with the bar in pursuit, catching the young boy at the edge of the cornfield. Winderling pleaded for Muir to help him, then asked the bar not to kill him. The bar asked Paul to be still and plunged a knife into his neck, killing him instantly. Muir, witnessing the murder, ran to his father's house, while the bar dragged the lifeless body of 14-year-old Paul Winderling back to the Muir house, then set it ablaze. The bar went back for Mary. However, her wounds were not as severe, and she was able to escape. The bar then fled into the night and disappeared.
After Muir sounded the alarm, Washita County Sheriff Blasia Spinharney sent his deputies in all directions with other residents to search for the bar. The hunt began early on August 2nd, 1855. A wanted poster with a $100 reward was offered, but quickly doubled to 200. However, during the rush to get things done, there were numerous errors on both copies of the rewards, which resulted in some confusion. Reports circulating about the bar's whereabouts seemed to be focused down in Milwaukee. Those speculations ended a little after 10 p.m. on Thursday, August 2nd, when DeBar was spotted in Milwaukee's first ward and was taken into custody. Now, John Muir was actually known in Milwaukee for a time he was employed as a butcher. And after reports circulated that it was Muir that was attacked, threats of violence were made against DeBar. At first, DeBar claimed he was innocent and struggled against being taken to jail, all the way receiving blows and kicks from the unruly crowd. At the jail, the bar insisted that they had the wrong perpetrator. On Friday, August 3rd at 10.30, the bar was removed from the Milwaukee jail and his journey back to West Bend commenced. By the time they stopped for dinner at a tavern in Sockville, the bar had confessed his guilt. So what? If any reason was there to commit such a crime? Turns out the bar may have had one. During the spring election, Muir apparently struck the bar from behind with a club at a town of Trenton polling place. Working for Muir in late July, the bar became infuriated after overhearing John tell his wife that he had hit the bar and wished that he killed him. Two days before the murder, the bar told Mrs. Muir that he was going to kill her husband. On August 3rd, the bar also confessed that his intention was to kill John and no one else. Before reaching West Bend, Sheriff Spinharney asked DeBar, aren't you afraid people are gonna kill you here? DeBar responded, I deserve it. If they do hang me, I have nobody to blame but myself. Residents of West Bend were quite irate upon hearing the condition of 14-year-old Paul Winderling's body. He was so close to Muir's burning house that the left arm and part of his face were severely burned and his head was nearly decapitated as well. I am at the former Washington County Courthouse, which is now home to the Washington County Historical Society. And over there is the former jailhouse, which is now a museum. These buildings were constructed in the late 1800s and were not the actual buildings. However, it was on this particular land that the courthouse and jailhouse stood in 1855. Since West Bend had recently split from neighboring Ozaki County, both the courthouse and the jailhouse were constructed as mere framed buildings and some were concerned that the facility could not keep the bar safe from any attempts to kill him. The undersheriff, Gottlieb Weiss, was nervous and suggested that the bar be moved back to Milwaukee for safekeeping until the trial, but that was struck down by Milwaukee Sheriff S.S. Conover. The bar was booked the following morning on August 4th, 1855. The next few days were quiet for the most part, however that would change on Tuesday, August 7th. Troops were on their way from Ozaki and Milwaukee, and about 100 people gathered at about 10 a.m. in front of Goder's Tavern to discuss the trial. Some became noisy, and most were in agreement that the bar should be lynched. The trial was scheduled for 11 a.m., and by that time, the crowd had tripled in size and was heading towards the jail. When they arrived, they were greeted by the Ozaki troops who had surrounded the building. The hearings began, and with the courthouse packed full of people, Judge Charles H. Larrabee had a hard time swearing in the jury because of the noise. 
Some were displeased with the makeup of the jury, so several men from the crowd were chosen to join the panel, which offended others in attendance. The next couple hours were for testimonies, and then the jury was placed in a room to decide DeBar's fate. By 5 p.m., with the jury still deliberating, the crowd both inside and outside the courtroom had become increasingly unruly, and about an hour later, the jury returned with the indictment. After Judge Larrabee read the indictment, DeBar pleaded not guilty. After DeBar pled, Judge Larrabee set a jury trial for the next day, Wednesday, August 8th. DeBar was then ordered back to his cell. However, he would never make it. As they made their way outside the courthouse, they were overcome by the mob. The troops, ordered to protect DeBar, had abandoned the prisoner to the fury of the mob. Take DeBar and lynch him, the mob cried. There was a surge, and DeBar, along with Under Sheriff Weiss, were brought to the ground. The crowd attacked DeBar relentlessly from this point on, kicking and punching him. At some point, someone had picked up a tree stump weighing roughly 150 pounds and dropped it on DeBar's head, which left the prisoner without motion, and some considered him dead at that point. While DeBar was face down, he was then struck by a large stone on his head, crushing the skull, followed by one fiend, then jumping with his full weight on DeBar's mangled head. DeBar was then dragged through the streets of West Bend towards downtown. I'm now at the Milwaukee River, and over here is Washington Street. Sometime before 7 p.m. on Wednesday, August 6, 1855, the macabre procession of lynchers with George DeBar in tow, who was still alive at this point, arrived at a tree somewhere in this area on the west side. He was then strung up by his heels to the tree by at least four men. DeBar's head was seen jerking while hanging. One onlooker, Ansel Tupper, was horrified to see DeBar breathing the strangling blood and dirt and being in the most excruciating pain. DeBar hung by his feet for about 20 minutes before being taken down, only for the rope to be handed to the mob again. One person cut the rope from his feet and then put it around his neck. It was at this time where 12 to 20 people gathered around George drug him across the old bridge across the Milwaukee River to the East Bank. So 12 to 20 people dragged George Jabbar across the old bridge that went across the Milwaukee River here with about six men dragging him by the rope tied to his neck. The bar was moving his hands and rolling up his eyes and groaning as he was kicked off the end of the bridge to another tree where he was hung by the neck this time to die by a murderous mob. George DeBar, who finally succumbed to his injuries from the attack and lynching at the hands of a mob, was cut down from a tree after hanging for another 20 minutes by two men, William P. Barnes and Jacob McDonald, who also covered expenses for the burial. The body was placed in Martin Foster's one horse wagon and set out for Barton. Now the area that we're driving through right now, this is Barton. The bar's remains were placed in a shroud and were taken to Barton Cemetery. I'm here at Barton Cemetery, resting place of George DeBar. Somewhere on these grounds, in an armor grave, are the remains of a man beaten and lynched for the murder of a 14-year-old Paul Winderling. Now, with DeBar dead, and no one to be held accountable for the murder, sights were then set on finding those who assisted in DeBar's lynching, and this would be no easy task. The military companies called in to protect DeBar would now be blamed for his death. The Washington artillery from Milwaukee would bear a brunt of the criticism. Some blame both Ozaki and Milwaukee's troops for abandoning the prisoner to the wrath of the mob. 
A three-member court of inquiry was appointed and a hearing was set for November 21st, 1855 to look into the artillery's conduct. However, the members of the court never showed up and the inquiry never happened. Eight days later, the Washington County Board came down with a verdict, refusing to pay the Milwaukee troops for their services. This turned out to be par for the course, for reimbursements never to be fulfilled. Some residents believe that had there been no military, there would have been no lynching. I am at the grave of Reuben S. Rusko. On Friday, August 10, 1855, Justice Reuben S. Rusko presided at an inquest into the death of DeBar. The jury concluded that DeBar died by the hands of the mob and accused 19 people of being responsible. Sheriff Spinharney resigned rather than serve notices on the 19 accused. No further action was taken. On October 15, 1855, a grand jury brought 19 indictments of first-degree murder. The 19 were charged with fixing and fastening, choking, suffocating, and strangling DeBar, who instantly died. After the county jail had been strengthened and other security measures taken, arrest warrants were finally issued on February 13, 1856, and the trial was set to begin on April 29, 1856. The trial did in fact begin on the 29th of April with a change of venue request, which was denied by Judge Larrabee. Various witnesses were called and some defendants were accused of being involved at every stage. One of these defendants was no other than John Muir, the bar's intended victim. That trial ended in not guilty verdicts for all 19 defendants. New indictments were issued immediately after the acquittals and yet another trial started in April of 1857. However, those charges were dismissed due to double jeopardy. You can't try someone a second time for a crime they were already acquitted once for. The defense successfully argued. So what was the verdict in the DeBar lynching? Well, there never was a final verdict. That verdict belongs to history. I hope you enjoyed this look into the dark history of West Bend, Wisconsin. If you did, please like and subscribe and click on that bell for notifications on new episodes. Please visit www.patreon.com forward slash road trips with Yogi and consider becoming a supporter of this channel. Thanks again to Jane Nathan Couch for informing me about the DeBar lynching and thanks to Jack H. Anderson and the Washington County Historical Society for preserving this piece of history. And Charlie Hints and Mental Shed Studios for the use of the updated cover. Dark Lanterns, go get yourself a copy. Thank you for watching. I'm Yogi, and until next time.